What's up, polyphonics.org? Nick Finzer back for another vlog. This time I'm joined by Mr. Jeremy Siskind for a little interview following on our trend from the last time with Chris Ziemba. So for those of you that don't know Jeremy, could you give a little background about uh, who you are? Sure. Um, so I graduated from Eastman in 2008 um, with my undergraduate degree. I studied jazz piano and music theory there. Um, and I came to New York for about four years. I actually got a master's at Columbia in English comparative literature um, while kind of starting my jazz career. Um, did a lot of teaching for a few years and did a lot of playing, did some recording. Um, I guess those are the things I do. Um, and uh, now I've spent two years working at Western Michigan University as a professor of jazz piano. Um, and I get to teach classical music, I get to teach jazz music, um, I'm teaching a course in songwriting, um, and that's most of what I do, I guess. One thing I, that you did not mention, okay, you started at Eastman, but uh, could you let people know where maybe you grew up before Eastman? Yeah, so I'm from Irvine, California, uh, which is in Southern California, like an hour south of LA. Okay, and what kinds of things were you involved with musically at that point? I was really lucky, I think, uh, with my musical upbringing. Uh, my high school was Irvine High School, and we had a really great jazz band with a really great director, and there was actually kind of a lineage and a history of really good musicians who have gone there, um, who had attended Berkeley and Manhattan School of Music, and a lot of people were going to USC. Um, and I got involved through kind of, you know, your local all-star bands with some guys uh, from Long Beach, which is only about a half hour away, and, and from L.A. Um, but some of the Long Beach guys in particular have really gone on to have nice careers. A bunch of the guys who I used to play with in Long Beach are now the, like, the band for the rapper Nas. Really? Um, yeah. Wow. And we used to play all kinds of jazz gigs together. Nice. Um, and so, yeah, I, I got exposed to some really great players really early on. Wow. When you're here in New York, mm -hmm. what kind of gigs were you doing? What kind of professional situations were you involved with during your four years here? <laughs> it was kind of all over the map, like uh, I think is the case for many professionals. You know, uh, for me, I got to do a lot of background piano gigs. I got to do some classical piano gigs, some Broadway accompanying. I love working with vocalists. I did a lot of accompanying vocalists. Um, I actually accompanied both the Columbia University and NYU vocal jazz ensembles at one point. Um, and then playing at some of the clubs, uh, sometimes as a leader, sometimes with other groups, um, in more traditional jazz settings. So how do you find that your experiences in school at Eastman, uh, at the jazz school, translated to prepare you or not to prepare you for your professional career? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, certainly musically, for the most part, I was really well prepared, you know, um, I think the playing that we did um, as part of the curriculum, but maybe as much or more so the playing that we did individually. Uh, you know, I got to run my own trio um, and, you know, just have a lot of those kinds of professional experiences. Um, you know, that all certainly prepared us very well. And we had professors that kept us to a really high standard mm -hmm. um, and, you know, got on us for any bad habits or any bad decisions we were making. Um, so that, that I think uh, prepared us really well. Um, certainly, um, you know, I work with vocalists a lot and that was one thing that wasn't really present mm. at Eastman, um, a focus on accompanying. And it's actually interesting where I teach now, we have a really big vocal jazz program. So I work a lot with my students on accompanying and that was something that, you know, we really didn't have the opportunity to work on at Eastman for better or for worse. Mm. Um, and certainly the business interactive side of of everything you know especially in New York it's just so it's such a jungle here <laughs> um, and Eastman is a bubble for, sure. for better or for worse and I think I wouldn't trade that bubble at that time of my life for anything mm -hmm. but it doesn't always you know uh, prepare you sure <laughs> totally adequately for what happens mm -hmm. when you get out of the bubble yeah I totally agree yeah did you have any particular experiences or teachers that when you reflect you found were particularly uh, important in your development? Yeah, I mean, so much of it. Um, certainly my uh, main teachers there were Harold Danko and Tony Caramia, and, you know, they both had a huge influence on me as well as playing in Bill Dobbins' big band, you know, it was an experience that I won't uh, soon forget. 
Um, but maybe the part of my education that ended up being the most unique was my music theory part of the education. Um, I get to take two independent studies, which for me were just totally invaluable. Um, for one semester, I got to work with Dr. Matthew Brown on improvising in the style of Debussy preludes. And then for a semester, I got to work with Darius Tarafanko on improvising fugues. Oh, nice. And, um, you know, those, I think, are things that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else and that mm -hmm. have really, I think, shaped my professional and artistic career a little bit because those two uh, composers and those two forms are things that really continue to be a great interest to me. Um, so those were really vital. What made you choose to do another degree program after Eastman in a complementary subject? Well, it was kind of two, two different reasons. One was totally in terms of my education. Um, Eastman was a very focused education, um, and I had kind of other things that I wanted to explore that I'd gotten really interested in while I was at Eastman. Um, and a lot of them have fed into my music. Um, I studied a lot of poetry, and I actually did my thesis at Columbia mm -hmm. on... Um, poetry settings and um, you know now I'm writing a lot of lyrics and I'm teaching a lot about lyrics and mm -hmm. so that's directly kind of fed in to what I do the other half was I mean frankly fear um, and you know that thought that I think everybody has as they get like the middle of their junior year at Eastman of like okay I'm about to graduate right. what am I going to do um, and this for me it was a great way to get me to New York mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think I would have ever had the courage to just come to New York without something steady. Sure. Um, and I got to come here and study with the people who I wanted to study with uh, musically while pursuing this other degree, which has opened up other professional opportunities. Mm. That's cool. So uh, I know now, uh, before we talk about your current gig, sure. um, I've always enjoyed your trio that you've been leading now. Could you... Maybe tell people a little bit about, about that group. Yeah, so I have a band, kind of my main running project is called Finger Songwriter, which is a uh, name that the New York Times called cringe-inducing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's kind of modeled after Norma Winston's bands that had John Taylor and Tony Coey. Um, it's a voice, piano, and woodwind band with one woodwind player uh, playing clarinet, saxophone, and bass clarinet. Um, alternatively um, and uh, I probably meant to say alternately alternately, <laughs> alternately. <laughs> um, and uh, so the music is generally kind of lyrical it's chambery I like to say that it's kind of in the middle between chamber music singers the singer songwriter genre and jazz so we do a lot of improvising but the lyrics are kind of in this like confessional mode like you might hear from Joni Mitchell or James Taylor, mm -hmm. um, but the orchestration and I think the way that we um, interact and breathe together and move together is more reminiscent of chamber music. Mm. And I know that you've pursued some alternative uh, performance opportunities with that group. Maybe you could... Yeah, so we specialize in house concerts. Uh, we've done about 60 in-home concerts in 15 different states over the last two years. Um, and we love it. Um, partially because that group, it is between those three genres and it doesn't fit neatly into any of these, uh, you know, any of the performance facilities that would normally sure. be, uh, be open to us. Um, but it also gives us a chance to tour, have a full audience in a city where we might know nobody, um, and it allows us to reach kind of uh, different audiences with our music. One of the things that I was really tired of in New York was playing gigs and basically having fellow musicians come and people who you know come. And, you know, to a certain degree, it makes you ask, why are we doing sure. this? <laughs> if we're just all feeding each other, right. you know, what's the point? Mm -hmm. But with these house concerts, you know, the person who hosts the concert has to have a piano and be somehow connected to me. But beyond that, they invite 20 of their friends who could be anybody, their kid's teacher or their yoga instructor or, you know, whatever. Um, and it's great to see these people who wouldn't, on their own, really choose to come to a jazz or classical or art music concert mm -hmm. and to see their reactions. And oftentimes, you know, they're asking, why didn't I do something like this sooner? Um, so it's been a really rewarding experience. How did you come to the conclusion that you wanted to pursue that? Um, so part of it was uh, a lack of other options. I'd come out, uh, we'd done a CD that we were really proud of, and as I started 
you know, I really wanted to tour with the music and share the music with yeah. people. Um, but I didn't know where we were going to get books, honestly. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'd had a lot of good experiences playing house concerts. Oftentimes, if I were going to do a classical performance, I'd do a warm-up in somebody's house, kind of for friends and family and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it always seemed like those were the best, most enjoyable concerts. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put those two things together and decided that that'd be a good route to take. Wow. Yeah, it seems like it's been very successful for you, yeah. for you guys so far. And you guys have another one coming up soon, right? I have two house concert tours planned for the summer. Um, in the, the very end of June, the band's going to go from New York uh, to Kalamazoo, partially because I have to bring my car from New York to Kalamazoo. Um, nice. And then later um, in August, I'm going to be going from Sacramento up to Seattle, which I'm just kind of looking forward to, to like see the Pacific Northwest nice. and to hang in that area. Yeah. Cool. So, so now that we've mentioned Kalamazoo, okay. how, where, how did that opportunity for you to, you're, you're at which school again? Western Michigan University. So how did that whole opportunity come, come to be? Man, that's, that's, a, long, uh, that's a long story. Um, essentially, um, their former piano faculty had been there forever, and he got a really nice offer, and he left the school very late. Mm -hmm. um, in the summer for them to find a replacement probably like the end of June um, and so they started putting feelers out and they needed somebody who could uh, teach both classical and jazz now I had just done a recital at Carnegie Hall where the first half was Debussy etudes and the second half was jazz mm -hmm. and so a few people um, who were in the business so to speak remembered that recital and recommended me one of which being my mentor Fred Hirsch um, the other being the director of the American Pianist Association, Joel Harrison. Um, so it was one of those kinds of things that, one of those funny things where actually the two of them had both recommended me to different people and they didn't know about each other. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that came together <laughs> and they said, oh, wow, both of these people who we respect recommended right. this guy. Mm -hmm. So even though I kind of don't have the traditional degrees that one would expect you know, for a college professor... Um, the strength of their recommendations, I think, en ended up getting me that gig. Nice. And did you find? Do you find that? Uh, did your education from Eastman prepare you for that? I know you weren't necessarily an education major, but did you feel like you were prepared to take on the role of prof jazz professor? Yeah, to to a certain degree. It's interesting. You know, I think a lot of people who end up going into uh, you know academic life. I've gone to maybe two or three different schools to pursue a master's and a, mm -hmm. and a doctorate, and I'd only really done the one degree in jazz. So I was so used to the way that we did everything at Eastman that it was kind of jarring to go and, and do it somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I felt pretty well prepared. We did have a pedagogy class at Eastman. Um, and the great thing about my position at Western Michigan is that it kind of allows me to thrive in what I do well. Um, I don't have to lead the big bands, mm. and I don't have to um, do an arranging class and all these things that I wouldn't really feel that comfortable with. Um, I can kind of do a lot of coaching small groups. I teach jazz composition. I teach piano pedagogy, which is really fun. Mm. Um, and I do things that I feel really comfortable with that I think um, you know, highlight my strengths. For any students that are, might be watching this now, what kind of advice might you offer for someone that's interested in taking a performance path like yours or, and, oops, and slash or a yeah. teaching path? Okay, here, I got a few things. Okay. Um, one is, ask yourself, what need can I fill? Mm. Um, for me, one of the reasons that I'm doing uh, the kind of ensemble that I'm doing with the voice piano woodwinds is that I feel like nobody else is doing that. Um, I'm also, of course, passionate about the music, but I'm passionate about a lot of things, and, but that was something where I felt I could really actually fill a need. Um, and I always kind of, I always try to tell my students that you need to be really good at your instrument, plus have one, one other thing that you're really good at. Hmm. Um, so for some people, it's you're really good at your instrument and you're really good looking. <laughs> That wasn't the case for me. <laughs> for some people, it's you're really good at your instrument and you're a really good businessman. You're a really good networker. For some people, you're really good at your instrument and you have great skills recording others. Mm. Um, for some, you know, for me, I was pretty good at my instrument. Um, I played jazz and classical and I had this English degree, which I think, you know, made me a little bit more interesting to people. So I guess that's another thing is 
what ask yourself what's the other skill that's gonna make people think of you for that gig mm. that is like oh man I need a trumpeter and somebody to record the band <laughs> and then it's like I, I know just sure. the guy right right um, also I'd say have have stuff ready don't wait for somebody to say that they need you to do something um, I've been able to write a bunch of educational books and it's partially because when I was approached I had something totally ready to go um, and so I think um, and now I, I try to stay ahead of the curve and have a ton of things ready to go for when that opportunity comes mm. um, so those are some things to start oh that's good um, so, in the next couple of months, what are some of the projects that you're looking, that you're looking forward to, or maybe not looking because <laughs> you have to do them anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a I have a couple of home concert tours coming up. Right. Um, so I'm currently speaking of doing things that you don't know anybody wants yet. Um, I'm writing a set of fugues that I want to. I'm trying to like put a concert together where I'll alternate like a Bach fugue and then one of my fugues, which oh, is, nice. you know, kind of silly thing to do, um, but I'm gonna do it. And in the next couple of months, I, I have to, or I get to, uh, go and present my books to a lot of people. Um, I have a new book coming out actually later this week, called the Jazz Band Pianist, which is a big instructional book. Um, for basically kids who want to play piano in their high school or middle school jazz band. So really excited about that coming out. Excited for people to hear about that. Um, and I have a new CD that just got mixed and I'm kind of working on labels, trying to find a good home for that. And that's with that finger songwriter group, plus uh, guest vocalists, Kurt Elling, Peter Eldridge, and Kendra Shank. So yeah, I'm really excited about all those things. And I know uh, you're doing a little bit of traveling internationally this summer for some teaching, right? Yeah. Um, so I was just in Thailand last month. Um, I've gotten hooked up with these really cool people who do jazz education abroad. 75% um, chance I'm going to Kathmandu in August um, to do some teaching. And then I have China in November. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. I want to thank Jeremy for being here today to talk a little bit. And we'll see you guys next time on the vlog.